You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! There's not a lot of things that have been analyzed more than art. I think it's maybe the money involved and probably our feelings, but we've gone to great lengths to try to understand why certain paintings have such a huge impact on the world and on us and go for so much money. And we analyze deeply, sometimes using really impressive tools. But I think that deep down there's something that's not satisfying about it. We asked Basquiat about his interest in anatomy. I, I want to do some anatomy stuff. So why'd you want to do anatomy stuff? Because I felt like it. In my heart, it doesn't seem to lead to what I want to know about the painting. And I think we can learn more about it if we start studying it through the things that go into the emotional reaction we have to that art. And I want to apply those ideas to a specific example. In this case, let's use Banksy, an artist who became very famous and whose work has started selling for a whole lot of money over the last 10 or 20 years. Now, in the Fame series, we introduced the idea of our emotions being the result of a total amount of outside things that go into how we feel about a specific person. But when we look at art or things that come from a person, there's many other things that can come into it as well. And the first thing I want to really go into is where the art community came from in the first place. Why there was an art establishment for Banksy to become rich in. Like we've been talking about on the channel, the reputation of something is huge to the emotional effect it has, and specifically to the large amount of money that people are willing to pay for certain works of art. But that reputation always has to come from somewhere, and we've detailed in the past the process by which other external things fill in for the emotional power that the reputation gives until the thing acquires that reputation. Here's how that specifically happened with painting. Originally, of course, there weren't photographs. The only way you could see places that you'd never get to visit and people you'd never get to meet was by looking at paintings. So, painters were very important. They were the original photographers. And the skill of a painter was in how accurately they could represent reality. And not a lot of people could do it. So naturally, the price for paintings went up. But now we have photographs. So painting no longer serves that purpose. And it also doesn't necessarily indicate the same type of talent from a painter. And paintings and art trade off of the other emotional effects that they can create with you. That means the paintings no longer have to represent reality. If they have a strong reputation in history, or the artist themselves has enough personal charisma or attraction, the painting will still go for a large amount of money, even if there's nothing there. And this is where abstract art emerged from. Which is okay, because it keeps the art community going and allows some artists to make a living. Like specifically artists like Banksy, who don't specialize in representing reality, even though their work portrays real people. But to do that, to get to that level where you're successful, you have to have the outside emotional effects alongside your work. And Banksy provides us a great example of that. People often get frustrated when they look at his work, because he does it with stencils which means it doesn't take a lot of time for him to make a painting. <laughs> Stencil maker in the house. <laughs> Trust what the Vinci did. And because there's not a lot of effort going into it, we can't appreciate the personal sacrifice that we see with a lot of other artists. And that's a lower emotional effect, which leads some people to think that the art itself should also be less valuable. But that's not necessarily the case. Because the way emotional indiscretion works is that there's a lot of different things that can hit the same emotional triggers for us. And there's so much going into his work that it doesn't matter that it's easier for him to make. Like, first of all, he's a graffiti artist. Graffiti naturally has a great amount of tension. We know that the graffiti artist isn't supposed to be where they are. They can get caught. They're taking a personal risk. Likewise, graffiti allows an artist to use lateral movement. And this is something we talked about in the How to Get Famous videos. You have to find a way to fill in the missing emotional aspects of what's going on for somebody to start to view you as though you were a celebrity or you were important. And lateral movement is a simple way of doing that by associating yourself with something that already has that effect. So when you place a painting on the side of a wall or on a subway car or something where a large number of people see it, you already get that public exposure. People already see you out in the wild, outside of friendship or other relationships, in the same way they take in a famous person. And that alone gives you an emotional boost as well. You're already in the place of influencing the public and getting in front of a lot of people. On top of that, he relates his art to known public things, popular TV shows or movies or political issues of the time. 
It's one of the things that make Picasso's Guernica so valuable. We can't divide it. It just makes us think the painting is even better. And of course, Banksy's a very talented artist himself. His paintings do look aesthetically appealing, which is an important part of things as well when you look at the way all these things come together. But in a lot of cases in the past, these things have kind of happened accidentally. They come together whether an artist realizes it or not, and that makes them popular later. I don't necessarily think that that's the case here. I think over time, Banksy started doing these things on purpose. Of course, when he started out, he hid his name, and that might have been because he didn't want to get into trouble. But later on, I think he realized that the mystery that's associated with hiding your name has a strong emotional effect as well. That also releases the same dopamine chemical as anything else and gets people interested in your artwork. And there's also the side benefit to that, where when you hide your face, it's not a threat to people's reputation if you become well known, which kind of greases the wheels to make people want to share your work and accept you as a popular person. And he goes out of his way now to bolster his reputation and specifically play games and entertain the public. Which, by the way, requires a great sense of humor and shows that he's a really smart guy. He released his own documentary, for example, and he did a stunt recently where one of his paintings sold for a huge amount of money. And afterwards, supposedly, a shredder destroyed the painting. Obviously, I think that was orchestrated. The auction house was probably in on it because there's no way you could build a remote shredder into something and have the battery in the shredder last as long as it did. Which shows that... Really, he's playing this game too, and he's out to entertain people, and that's a key part of why the value of his art has gone up so much. But another key part of this is that it shows that you don't necessarily have to be from the 1500s or 1600s to be a commercially valuable artist. Yes, when you die, that's another huge protection of esteem to people, and it adds a great amount of poignance to look at the work of somebody who's no longer here. But again, that just hits one of only a small handful of pleasure chemicals in our brain. And if you're doing enough other things, if you're in front of enough other people, if you're using that lateral movement to associate yourself with popular things, if you create that mystery around yourself, you can still get that emotional level to the point that people react to you in the same way they do those other artists who aren't here anymore. Which is probably really important if you want to be a successful artist while you're still alive. And overall, I think this is probably the best way for us to discuss art. When we get into analyzing the half-life of the elements that are in the paint and all these other things, I think we distract from the things that are right in front of us that actually play a real role in making art popular. I don't think anybody really believes that if you used a different type of pigment, it would change the price or value of that painting. But we found that if the painting is taken out of the emotional context in which people see it, the value does drop. And we've seen that with Banksy's artwork itself when people sell it on the corner without knowing it's a Banksy. A lot of people won't buy it even for a low price. So when we talk about art, we need to talk about the artist themselves. We need to talk about what has happened to that artwork in the real world, how those things affect us emotionally, and include that with every discussion of the painting's value, because those things play a key role in creating the reputation of a work of art and in how that work of art works on our minds and our hearts. It's three-dimensional. And all those things go into the reputation of a painting once people start bidding on it, especially people who have enough resources that that work of art gives them that rare increase in their status that makes them willing to pay so much money and makes art such an incredibly valuable thing. And we'll continue talking about art that way in the future. I have some other topics lined up on that. And also a special announcement. I put a paper on Phil Papers and Social Science Research Network recently that's about Aristotle's poetics, where I went through Aristotle's recommendations of how a story should be written, and I showed how many stories today and in the past have violated those rules but still been successful. And I then showed how you can adjust the recommendations that Aristotle made to cover all those exceptions. And not only does it demonstrate what I think are some really important fundamental changes to the way we look at storytelling, but also many other areas of art like we've been talking about here. So I'll put a link to that in the description. You can check that out. It's pretty long, but I think it's still pretty cool. And I'll be back later. Thanks.